Hello everyone. Welcome to the March 2024 Cataloging Special Interest Group. Uh, today um, I did have a something submitted ahead of time. Lizette is here and has a very exciting bug that I've been on the CC for a long time on that she would like to talk about. Bug number 15500. I'll put the link in the chat. So or, this book is for already adding, there. Oh, yep. For adding a ferberized view to OPEC and staff interface results. And there's a lot of different ways to go about it. But we do have a um, dev request that's probably going to go to crowdfunding. Uh, so I wanted to get some feedback before we end up posting that, um, whether it's on the bug or in the meeting, if you have ideas about how you'd like to see that implemented um, so that it works for catalogers, that would be very helpful for us. And I know there's a lot of discussion on there. Um, a couple years ago, Jesse Zaro did put up like kind of a rough here's what we're thinking but then there's also been discussion on here since then from a couple of people who are in this meeting um as well as some other folks and so i just want to give you a heads up that we're working on putting together a new scope document for this to post on our new crowdfunding website um yeah so I don't know if you want to have a chance to look over it and just put comments or if any of you have any feedback now, either way. Um, I'll mention, since maybe not everybody knows all the acronyms, FERBR, F-R-B-R, I believe it's Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. Thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up. And actually, I um, just looked it up. I was going to ask you to explain it for uh, those of us <laughs> who might not be familiar because I keep forgetting. It's not an acronym we toss around every day to everyone. Usually, you know, we don't come home from work and say, oh, honey, I saw the most excellent Ferberized record cluster. Or maybe we do. I don't know. Um, it's a. Uh, what it does in catalogs that are starting to do this is you would tend to have like a work record, like perhaps a work record for Wizard of Oz. And then maybe there would be links or tabs for, say, all the print book editions. And then the movies and the plays and the, the cast recordings. And for anyone who has like Aspen, yeah, Aspen is verbalized. So that is like a good example of how it might work in an OPAC. But we're talking about doing that both for the Koha staff interface and also for the regular OPAC for folks that don't have Aspen. So that's what this development would do. And yeah, there's a there's a couple different options of using a specific field, or there was discussion of using like an authorities like function and a couple of places that are starting to do the ISNI, which is like an ISBN, but for the work rather than for the edition, right? Is that, yeah. I think so. Um, although it seems to mostly be music things and a few specific like types, there's like not a single issuing authority for it. Um, mostly it seems to be, most of the issuing authority seems to revolve around music, but it's um, not just for that. There's also one issuing authorities for books and other record types. So, um, yeah. I'm going to put a link in the chat to the ISNI dot org because it is an ISO standard but I'm super vague on it yes Margaret yes Aspen is verbalized yeah 
worldcat.org is also verbalized mm -hmm. to some extent. Those of us in really specialized libraries like mine are even excited about this because we've got, for example, Moby Dick. Oh, yeah. I think it's exciting that there's some movement on this the week after I sign a contract with Aspen. That's what did it. More like we were, have been going back through our old uh, developments and cleaning up ones that didn't make it onto the new crowdfunding site for whatever reason or just um, needed some more information and getting things moving again. Oh, yeah, and we being Bywater, yes? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I work at Bywater Solutions. I didn't introduce myself. I introduced myself yesterday at the general meeting and then completely forgot for this one. So I am Lizette Shear. I work at Bywater Solutions. I'm on the development team. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing is making sure that development requests are getting properly tracked and has all the information before it makes it to our developers so that we can get quotes and information as fast as possible. And then I'm also doing partner acceptance testing. So when you have either when we have a bug that we know is affecting partners and we need to get it signed off because we can't sign off on our own bugs, but we can help our partners sign off on our bugs so that they can get those fixes in faster. And especially when we're doing paid developments, making sure that what is getting signed off is what the partner who has paid for it or whoever has paid for it wants out of it when it's getting signed off then we're not missing any steps, so. Okay, well, Lizette, congratulations. And didn't you have something to do with COA US sometime yes, in the past? I, I, I was the COA US president in 2019 and the vice president before that. And then I also did the, um, I was on various committees. Like I was on the conference committee for like three or four years. And I was on the development committee when we started that and I was on the I, education committee. I think you were the president in 2020 because you were the president oh, you're when, right. all, when everything went to hell. When, when COVID happened, you're right. Um, I must have been vice president in 2019 then. And president yeah, I was the president right before everything went to hell. You were the yeah. year of hell. Yeah. So George, you said uh, you helped set up the hell. No, I had nothing to do with COVID. I was nowhere near China with with bats and, you know, spreading viruses. That had nothing to do with me. Uh-huh. Okay. I'd, I'd be more suspicious of medical librarians, so. <laughs> this is our story and we're sticking to it. So Jason, well, I am a co-author on a paper uh, sort of investigating what to do about it. But I think that's my extent. I haven't e didn't even. Get to it. I did put a link in the yeah. chat to the um, Koha US meeting, the last one yesterday, because um, do do take a look. <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, a lot of bugs are talked about, and there were some cataloging bugs talked about too. Um, Jason asked in the chat if the Ferber dev still has a $30,000 price tag. We need to re-quote it because it's been a while since, I think the original quote was from like 2017. Um, so it's been a while and we want to make sure that, you know, some of the stuff might, I would, I have no idea how much it's going to cost, but what we're planning on doing is probably breaking it up into multiple smaller devs. Um, if you look at the bug that we shared, Jesse kind of put three phases in. And so let's see where this bug is. So we'd probably, you know, be able to do like group one separately. We wouldn't need like the if the whole thing was was, for example, thirty thousand dollars, no idea. I have to reboot it, but 
Jesse put like five groups in. So if the first group was say if it, if each group was six thousand dollars, the gold quote was thirty thousand dollars. Then you know once we got six thousand dollars, we could do part one. And once we got the next six thousand dollars and part one was done, we could do part two, etc. That it probably wouldn't come out evenly. A lot of times, what will happen is we'll have like because the parts are going to require different work. It's more split out on like, okay, here's what we need to do absolutely first to get it done. And that's often a bigger dev when they're split up like this. And then like the second and third ones still need to be done before we can move on, but maybe the actual work is going to be less work. So that's a slightly smaller dev kind of thing. And so we're definitely going to be able to break it down into multiple steps so that we can um, a get it through faster because when you try to make all the changes at once, it makes it a lot harder to get it through the community part of the development and also to get it done because you'll be doing it and stuff will change in Koha and you'll have to rebase everything and that takes time. So yes. Um, Okay, Jason, I will make sure to let you know once that's posted. And really, um, Jesse and I are going to be making sure that like once a month an email is going to be going out about, hey, here's what we're crowdfunding right now. Here's like the new stuff that we've added. Here's things that got funded recently, um, things like that, so that it's more, that information is more available. You don't have to like go look at the website every month to see if anything's been added and we're doing a lot more like adding a lot more bugs to that even if we you know do our initial quote we talked a little bit about the process yesterday but if we do our initial like here's the range for this quote if it's something that's going to be really popular even if that person comes back and says uh i we're not really interested in that. If it's something that like we get a lot of questions about, or if they say, but we'd like to add it to the crowdfunding site and do part of it, but we're also gonna be doing more of adding stuff that we get a lot of questions about. Um, even when people don't explicitly say that that's how they'd like to proceed if they don't want to proceed with the payment all on their library zone. So what Jason had put in the chat is, uh interest especially if one could get ferberized holds both the staff client and vanilla opac and then also lizette how about throwing into the chat the link to the bywater site about you know developments yeah. bugs crown funding and we have a brand new one we haven't even uh sent out an email about it yet but and we know that there is a typo on the catalog and granular permissions page, but uh, we haven't been able to actually edit the page since yesterday. We have an internal server error whenever we try to do that. So as soon as it's fixed, as soon as we can, we're going to fix the typo on the granular catalog and permissions um, page. And we're going to be adding a whole lot more here soon. We have, um, that's, I'm actually meeting with Jesse a minute ago to, to talk about uh, some of the stuff that we're going to add to the site and so we can get that ball rolling. We do have categories right now. There's just the four categories, uh, hold requests, acquisitions, APIs and plugins, and cataloging. But um, so if you wanted to like have a link to just the cataloging devs, that's also an option. Although I'm also seeing that like the cataloging permissions is in like the patrons dev because it's a patrons that are in the, or it's not categorized. That's interesting. Everything's related to cataloging at some level. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, but that's there. And, and we know, we know you put... Go. I know you, you just put the typo in there to entertain us catalogers too. Oh yeah, definitely. So I am going to uh, let you guys get on with your meeting, but if you put feedback in the bug, oh wait, I 
Well, I was going to say I'm interested in the verbalization, but I'm also interested in, I guess I'm needing to visualize, like, how does that change our workflow? Um, you know, what, what actually goes into it to create it? And does that have impact on my staffing and training of staff and all those things? Yep, and that's why we're looking for feedback from the catalogers on like how you'd like to see it implemented so that it makes sense and works and also won't just make everything in your life more difficult. Because um, this is I, a big deal and there's a lot of ways to go about it. And I'm sure that some of them are going to be easier for staff than other ways. I can envision one impact in that it would be similar to a serial. Right now, when I catalog a serial, I look for M alert to title changes, yeah, really, which are relationships to other things that I catalog in. And I could see when I'm cataloging, say, a book, and I discover that it's an adaptation of something or a new edition of something, or Moby Dick, then I would be cataloging that relationship in. And whether that's done through linking entry fields that Ferberize, the linking entry 7XX, or this field we're talking about in ISNI, uh, putting in a field that manually links it to its work record. And then there could also be a new need to create or catalog in work records, if it's done that way. You know, what mark fields it is pulling from? Like, is it just going to use the, the 245, the 246, the author fields, the publication, your 260, 264? Like, is that the 240? Look at the bug. Look at the bug. Okay. I gotta do that. Okay. Yeah. I would say everyone look at the bug, um, comment on the bug, because that's where the developers are going to see it. Uh, if if you have questions that for our group, we do have our email discussion group, and that um, that's fine too. Uh, bring them back to the meeting. Okay, I'm gonna uh, duck out and let you get to the rest of your meeting. Thanks for letting me uh, take over for a little while. See you later. <laughs> thanks, thanks for bringing it to our attention, Lizette. Good to see you. Come anytime. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye. And uh, Chuck, um, do you have something you wanted to bring up? You mentioned in the chat you have three items: a new plugin yes. to update mark fields, how to handle a 952J. Oh, and where to start with cataloging serials. Yeah. Which one would you like um, to talk about first? Well, the, the first one's the easiest. Uh, I've written a new plugin called Update Mark Fields. Uh, it's based on another plugin that was less um, broad in its scope. Uh, it's available there. We've been using it quite heavily to update the uh, control number one field for us. Um, since that's not in the standard edit capabilities, uh, unless you do it singly, you can't do it in a bulk fashion. So this takes a CSV file and, and does that. I'll post a link to the GitHub uh, page for it. Um, it's almost completely finished. Uh, it works fine. Uh, the issue is that it doesn't automatically find it if you go search for plugins. Uh, but if you have it, you can download the KPZs and, and so forth. So I'll get that going shortly, I hope. Um, so that's the easy one. Hopefully that'll be helpful for others. Uh, it, it's been very helpful for us. We're still scanning books. Uh, and so we've automated the scan process. People do the scans, uh, they get audited, then they, the files get dropped in a directory, automatic process uh, converts them to PDFs, uh, OCRs them, and then creates that plugin file and then adds the, if we can use that to add the uh, where the scans are at into the uh, Koha fairly easily. So works pretty well. Uh, we're doing about 30 books a week. So it's very helpful rather than manually putting that, that control number in for it. 
So that's the easy one. Uh, the second item is 952J. Um, it shows up in tab 10, uh, but it doesn't show up in OPAC if it's in tab 10. If you change it to the other tab, some other tab, it shows up there for OPAC, but then it doesn't show up in the staff edit client. I'm wondering, how do I deal with that? Is there an easy way to get it so I can see it in both places? Have you, the, the question that we always ask in these cases is, have you checked your bibliographic frameworks to make sure that the, the check boxes yes. are, okay. I, I did check that and I actually tried modifying a couple of frameworks to see if that would help, but it didn't seem to help any. So uh, basically I'm <laughs> there's also a, There's also a column visibility place. Yeah, yes, yeah. and that's how I changed it from going from uh, tab 10 to one of the other tabs. Um, it actually belongs in tab eight, I believe, it might be nine. Uh, and so if you switch it to that one, you can see it in the uh, OPAC just fine, but it doesn't show up in the edit client then, which is really kind of strange. So um, where do I where do I go to look that for, for the uh, next thing? Uh, could you post a screenshot somewhere? I, I've I sort of do done that. this kind of thing before. And I think if you're persuasive enough with the software, you can get it to do something. Okay. So I'm looking at my, I'm opening up my frameworks right now, and I'm trying to remember what the 952J is. That was all my of other the, question. All of the 952 data is item level data. Yes, it's a shelving control number. It's not a field right. we use, so it's not one I'm familiar with. Right. Yeah, um, I just open it up on mine, and I've got it set to subfield ignore um, okay, because so, we don't use it. So we're we're actually boxing up all our books after we scan them. And we're using a, another library, so branch. Uh, so we transfer those books to the other branch. And then we put in the shelving control number, the bo specific box information. So we uh, go find the book. Um, I'm open to doing it another way, but someone suggested that a couple months ago. And I tried it and it was working. It's working fine. Other than the fact that the people using OPAC can't see it. <laughs> That's, okay. I think the uh, issue is that it's the 952 is an item level field. Right. And you're trying to get it to, to, to display in the OPAC, it's going to be at the record level. So I'm not sure exactly how you would go about. Uh, I can tell you how I would go about okay. it. Uh, okay. This may not be the right way to go about it, but uh, if you, I can't remember which presentation it was in where I had a picture of a nail and a crescent wrench right next to it. Uh, it sounds like what I would do would be to modify the OPAC XSLT file to input the uh, 952J in the display. And I'd have to do that for both OPAC and the uh, client side. Uh, and somewhere, uh, let me see if I can find my rudimentary uh, page. We've had problems with things not appearing on the staff interface or the OPAC. It's because we needed to add something to the XSLT. Okay. So, that's what so, makes things visible. So if it's not okay. written in my code, it's not going to appear. Okay. So anywhere. I can go look at that and see how to get that field to display in the OPAC then. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, that's a good, great pointer. Uh, I am a developer. So obviously I did a, a plugin. So uh, I should be able to figure that out. It's taking a little bit. Uh, the yep. second um, question is, uh, go ahead, Fred. Uh, I was just going to say, let me uh, put in, uh, cut and paste. We have a lot of, I hope, semi-useful information on the how-to tab at the MedStar Authors site. Ah. And I don't know if you saw my uh, presentation in the author's catalog, I, I'm in uh, New Hampshire. I did an awful lot of editing of the uh, 
XSLT file to, to do ah. things that Co was never meant to do. Do you have a reference for that talk? Because I haven't seen it. I'm still fairly new to this. So. Uh, yes, I think I have it somewhere. If you could post uh, me a link for that, that'd be that. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. The, the last question I had was, where do I start in cataloging serials? We, we've got most of our books catalogs. We have a pretty good hand on that. Um, we loaded in our catalogs from Family Search, the books that we have that Family Search has cataloged. So they have some serials in there, but quite honestly, when they were using Olib, uh, they did not know what they were doing. And they have a mismatch of 15 different ways to do serials. And so I'm just looking, to, thanks for it. Uh, I'm just looking for a way to, you know, where do I start in cataloging serials showing what the right way to do it is because we now have to do our serials. So um, since you said showing the right way, uh, that made me think of how useful a well cataloged model record is. So I might pick the first one to be one that you know you could get a really good new record for from the Library of Congress, some sort of particularly mainstream serial, if you have that. If you don't, then just grab a nice, well-cataloged model record from the Library of Congress to have as reference. And in serials cataloging projects, typically, other people, please chime in. Um, you can approach it by doing your most frequently used ones first, because those are the ones people are going to want and be aware of and be excited about. Uh, but then there's also, that brings up tracking. How do you know what you've done, what you haven't done? You could also just start at the beginning where they are and just go. Um, but Either way that you do it, be aware of those things like relationships, title changes, have a workflow for, okay, I've grabbed this serial. How do I then grab and do all the related titles at once? Because you yeah. really want to. Uh, and I, I recognize I need to do that. And I understand the concepts of the linkages, the parents and grandparents and so forth. But how to do it in Koha is the, the real question. Where do I start to find that information? So... There's, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, I did put a good enough model record, um, and I think I did one for a serial. Uh, they just have a few other fields. It's, it's really not that hard. Okay. That'd be great if you put a link. I'd appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Gorsham, we're in the process of linking all of those titles with the distinctive names per volume to the parent record. Uh, do those last. Do the ones that the journal does not change the name and it just has 100 or 200 or you know 50 if you're lucky volumes to it. Those are very easy, very simple. It's just doing a straightforward record. Okay. When you start getting into linking fields, what we've discovered, the leader and the field you use matter. And it can start, we're having to deal with the way the Germans do it and the way the Library of Congress does it. And the, I feel like there's one more place that they do it differently. Like how they show the relationships is different. So we had to come up with, okay, this is going to be our model. We had to choose, like, which one do we use? How do we, but the, it only affects those that each volume changed its name and we wanted to catalog them as individual records and then link to the parent. Um, well, we're starting now. Go ahead. That'll probably cause me problems because um, most of the journals we have left to catalog, the, the rest were done a number of years ago and Family Search put them in wrong half the time. But the ones we have left are donations from the Sacramento Genealogical uh, German Society. And so they're mostly German journals. <laughs> um, and they fall in both categories. We ran into one yesterday that was... Uh, 
its name has changed twice over 200 years. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. Don't know how to do it, but understand. <laughs> and thank you for the reference. Chuck, um, I put a link to one of the um, Kelly and Jesse videos that dives into serials and Koha. Oh, so that might perfect. help get you started. Great. It's, thank ha you. it's half an hour long, so it's probably got fairly detailed information. Okay, perfect. Just what I needed. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I'd like to add uh, from my beginning days in Koha about 10 years ago, um, people said the serials module was not the most uh, user friendly. And I tend to agree. I I would rather do pretty much anything other than fiddle with the serials. Uh, but in particular, what I find troublesome or annoying, and there's probably a much easier way to do this. Uh, let's say we get uh, a serial every week. Well, let's say it's the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so it comes in you know, volumes and then also date. So what I've had to do is put the volume in with the volume number and then the date in, I think it's the 952Z public note. Yeah. <laughs> there she goes with her pearls, except she forgot her pearls. Yeah. No, I'm clutching uh, my... I have a wonderful picture of... <laughs> I'm uh, clutching my scarf. Um, I'm just going to okay. I'm going to interrupt you briefly and say uh, the serials module is for currently received subscriptions. If people have a and they're tracking a subscription with a particular vendor and they want to predict it and they want to know if they claim it. Yes. Fortunately, that's not our situation. We our In stuff is case, all archivals. In that case, what I said just said was completely irrelevant. <laughs> Well, it's relevant to those of us with currently received. Uh... That's right. <laughs> yeah, and I clutched my pearls because let me bring up a record. So I'm seeing the uh, correct fields here. So, of course, your catalog, your users, your needs, it's your right way. Um, we have all of our volume and date information in the 952 subfield H serial enumeration slash chronology. Thanks again. Great references. And, and bring your questions. I mean, you're going to have questions when you when you're cataloging your first serial, you're going to be like, is this right? Is this right? Go ahead and and throw out to our email list or bring your records here. Um, or even there's a lot of us on the Koha US email list. We're happy to even look at a particular record and and help you get you started. Well, thank you. So does anybody else have anything they'd like to bring to the group? I do. Um, I need to change the material type in some records. And my recollection is that you can't do that in the advanced editor because if you go into the 008 and you try to change the thing in the drop down there, it always reverts back to like books or something. So then I remembered there was some trick where you had to use the basic editor. And I know I've done it before. And I've gone into both the 008 and the 006 and there are places there where you can select a different material type. But no matter what I do, if I select it in one and save, or the other and save, or both and save, it doesn't update it. It just goes back to what it was. So I either don't remember how to do it, or it doesn't work that way anymore, or... I just answered this question for somebody like a week or so ago. 
uh, one of our catalogers wanted to know what was going on. And that um, when you pull up the, um, the basic editor and click on that little thing that lets you edit the 008 type of material um, isn't saved anywhere in the record. When you change that drop down, that when the when you look at the mark standard, it says these are the different meanings of these of, of each position of this field based on the type of material. But there's nowhere in the bibliographic record where the type of material is saved. So what you do to the 008 is based on the type of material, but there's nothing in the 008 where you specify the type of material. So all of that dropdown does is give you a different interface for entering the data into the 008. It doesn't actually, changing that dropdown that says type of material doesn't actually change anything in the record. It just changes the interface on that uh, little window that lets you edit the 008. Does that make sense? That makes sense. But so how do I still change it? <laughs> so what you do is, you know, I let me pull up a record right here and I can share my screen. That was what I was going to ask you to do. Yeah. So I've actually, I'm fixing a bunch of weird records uh, right this morning anyway. So if I go to the 008 and click on the little thing over here, see all of these different parts of this editor that pops up. You guys can see the little editor, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, in the editor, this first line says type of material and there's the drop down here, type of material, book, CF, CR, MP, MU, MX, VM. You see that drop down, right? Yeah. That's all of these things in here, the OO to 005, those are positions zero to five. That's edited here. All of these things relate to part of the long, this long coded field up here, except this one. This one doesn't actually change anything in the record. It just changes the interface. So does that make sense? Well, okay, that makes sense, but I still want to change it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so if you want to, like this is, um, let me go back to the OA. Let me share it again. So if I go in here and I want to make changes to the 008, I'm seeing this interface because it's automatically going to assume that this is a book because that's the default. So if this is actually a piece of music, I choose the drop down and it changes all of these descriptions over here. And then I go through and I, like if I was going to change this from single date to, uh, what is it? P is... Uh, or T is publication date and copyright date. So if I go ahead and change this and hit save, it's going to save the changes to the actual field. But when I open it again, it's going to be, uh, no, it's the 001, 008. It changes the actual field here. But when I open this again, it's going to default to books. All the values stay the same in the field, it's just that when I change this, I'm changing which editor interface is there. Okay. But so what I you're really doing when you change that interface is you're just changing the interface. And then you make the changes to the 008 and it saves the changes to the 008, but it doesn't change the material type because that that material type as it relates to the 008 is not stored anywhere in the mark record. And the and the list of material types that the that the Library of Congress has for the 008 don't match up to a list of material types saved anywhere in the mark record. The material type, the the type is saved in like what is it, the 
the 007 or the zeros is the 007 that is a different coded field that relates to, well, let me open it up again. <laughs> well, so I have some books that the material type is sound. And when I look at it in the catalog, it says material type sound and it isn't. Okay. So and that, that I think is stored in the 007. Sound. Yeah. And the, and the zero, zero field. See, when you go to the, the zero, zero field and click on the edit to open the editing box there, you get text, map, electronic resources, video recording, and there's a different set of things to change here. Okay. And when you, when you change this from, from text to video recording, or any of these others, that actually changes the data in the 007 because that's stored as the as character zero, the first character in that field. But when you change it in the, in the 008, this one isn't related to any of the other fields in there. And this list of material types doesn't match the list of material types in the 007. The bottom line is what this all boils down to is that Mark doesn't make sense. <laughs> and that's probably the first thing that probably they should teach in cataloging school, right? Is that Mark really doesn't make sense all the time. So that if you need, if you're having a material type that's showing up wrong in a record, I think you're probably what you want to change is the 007 and the 008 might be just yeah, the 008 might be just fine. It's the 007 that probably needs to be changed. I'll look at that. And then I know there's something similar in the 006 that has a drop down. And then I see Juliet says, I really need to be changing in the leader, maybe. Yeah, there might be something in the leader. This is why I'm not a cataloger. I hate this stuff. This is just well, crazy, see, I, you know. I know this I doesn't. Said. This probably made sense in 1968 when they were developing Mark, but it doesn't make that's sense what was, now. Yeah, that's what yeah, I was going to say. Saying, if you change but, position six in the leader, that changes what that drop down will show because that's what it's looking at to fill that drop down. Is it? It's the six position in the leader. In the leader, okay. Type of record. And, and, and I don't thing, know where that's mapped to the, where it decides what the drop down is based on the leader. I don't know. There's probably some mapping somewhere in there for that. Yeah. And this is another case where the list of, of options in type of record in the library and the LC standards for Mark, that list of, of, you know, it's got A, C, D, E, F, G, I, J, K, M, O, P, R, T, None of those match any of the other types of materials in the 007 or the 008. I mean, it's it's just, uh, they're not connected in any sensible way. So. It's my understanding the 008 is an older field. Yeah. And then... 007 or the leader in the 008 are very old fields take your take yourself back to the 1960s then the 007 and the 006 were developed for additional secondary characteristics other characteristics etc my favorite is the 007 because when i have to edit it i feel like james bond Let us know how it goes, Barbara. <laughs> I will. I'm poking around in it right now. In our catalog, we hide the material type because so many things will show up text item because it's a monograph item. And we have refined our item types so well now that that tells you what it is. And we have the 942C. So everything has the item type in the 942C, which makes it show up in the bibliographic record 
on the search results, on the item, like it shows up everywhere. So now that we've done all that, we can hide the material type because it's not specific enough. There's just too many things that are monograph item. <laughs> well, yeah, and and uh, looking at the the zero zero seven, the leader, the zero zero eight. That's for the title in general. That's the predominant type, and and yes, it yeah. Now, even the new three, three, six, seven, and eight that are supposed to make it more specific to item type. I'm like, all right, it's very complicated and it still doesn't give me enough information. I'll just make my own. So I did change the, um, what is it, bite six, position six. I did change it and saved it, looked in the LPAC, and it didn't change. Then I poked around some more. I don't think I changed anything else. And then when I bit, went back to the OPAC, it then refreshed, it had changed. So I don't know if it just took a second to register, but yeah, so that, that worked. I think that's what I used to do. I, I've done it before and, and it's like, I knew there was something, you couldn't do it in the advanced editor, you had to do it in the basic, but I couldn't figure out where to go. So thank you. We have a few more minutes if anybody else has anything. I have a question. Um, has anyone used the linking fields in Koha to create an index for their journals and or books? The books, I would use the 505 field and make that indexable. But so like each volume of a journal has articles some of this is because we have no money, but some of our journals are not in, like, no one has indexed them anywhere. <laughs> so, um, has, has anyone included that in their catalog that could? We will, like we will do an analytic record for an issue that we then use the 7xx linking entry fields for linking back to the parent serial for bringing out the articles in that issue. Do you have any special item types to show that this is an article within the journal? With yes, if we, if if we have an analytic for a whole issue, then our item type is periodical loose issue because we have different circulating rules for the loose issues. And then if we have an analytic for an article or a chapter of a book or something like that within something else, then that item type is article and it has no barcode. Because it's not a circulatable thing, so it doesn't get a barcode. Could you give us an example of that? Yeah, let me come up with an analytic in our OPAC. I think our special collections librarian would be so happy if we knew how to do that. you ever needed to go back and like edit a batch of article of article records in the future and if so how did you do that or did you just like because without the barcode it is a little bit harder to edit or to take out and do something and mark edit and then put it back in without oh yeah um i use the 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 item the batch item editor. Yeah.
Okay, I'm putting a link in the chat to a search in our OPAC that will give you all of our analytics, um, sort of newest to oldest, because the newest ones I think are cataloged the best. Uh, we do analytics for um, covers of journals. Um, there's a record, there's records for when stories are published across issues of serials. A lot of these you're going to see are for uh, pulp, pulp fiction, because they're not well indexed. And I'm also going to put a link in the chat to the Library of Congress's concert program um, to the concert cataloging guide. It has really, it's free. You can take a look at it. It has really good cataloging guidance. And if anyone has further questions or wants to talk over that again, bring them up and we can go into analytics in detail for sure. We have just a couple more minutes. If anybody has anything quick. Not at all quick, but uh, maybe something for next time or maybe for the uh, conference. I'm trying to find a way to justify Red Star sending me, but this won't be it. <laughs> uh, could somebody explain what ferberization is, what it does, and how it affects COA? That's too much to go into today, I know. But of course, if I'm the only person here that is is bewildered uh there's no point but i can just I, try to find I can, it i can briefly explain how it works in aspen so it takes it takes uh say moby dick and let's say that you have moby dick the book the audio book the ebook whatever format of books that you have all of those would come up as one search result subdivided for each different type of book um, movies are considered a different work. So if Moby Dick, the movie would be on its an own separate record, but if you had it on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, all of those would be grouped together under that one Moby Dick, the media or the video work. So what it does is when a patron searches for a title, instead of getting you know, 200 results where what they're looking for is, is got little bits and pieces here and there throughout. Maybe there's the regular print entry and there's the large print entry, et cetera. This groups them all together so they can then just hone in on what the physical type of work it is they want. Okay. The way I've described it to people in the past is it's like authority control for titles. So you've got one title for you've got a work called Moby Dick and it's a way of linking all of the different, I guess in Ferber, there's the work manifestation item. I'm missing one, aren't I? E work expression expression. 
So there's the work, the expression of the work, the manifestation of the items. So the work is Moby Dick. The manifestation is a like a specific edition of Moby Dick. The if expression, no, the expression is the, the man, sorry, the manifestation is the particular edition. The expression right. is that it's the printed word. It, it is in print. And then so the item would, is the actual uh, thing. Okay, so would, let's say, the audiobook and the print book be in the same record except under different expressions? They could be. They could be. The, and this is what Lisa needs input on right yeah like for for the work moby dick it's it's usually the an ideal that that's the ideal the manifestations would be the novel the film the the expressions of the novel could be the printed book put out by the University of California Press in 2019 and then the audiobook of that edition and da, da, da. and then the items something with a barcode that circulates it is a, it is a very big help for patrons to to be able to do a search and find you know, the example I always used to use was Great Expectations because I worked in a library where there were 40 different editions of of Great Expectations. The patron would say, well, which one? This, which one do you want? And they would say, I don't care. Which one's going to get to me faster? And when you ferberize things, they get one result. And then if they, they can just say, okay, I want that. And they can put a hold on it at the at the manifestation level and then get you know if they don't care which edition then that's fine but if they do care which edition they can drill down from that initial result of great expectations down to a specific edition maybe they need this edition by with the introduction by this other person with a critical apparatus at the end you know or maybe they need the shakespeare our our dan edition Arden second edition with all of the great stuff at the back, or maybe they need the third edition with all of the great stuff at the front. You know, it's, it's just a different, but, but when they do that initial search in the catalog, they just get one result instead of 40 results. So I just okay. put a link in the chat to Moby Dick in our catalog. And so you can see how there's one Moby Dick record that's broken down with audiobook, book, regular print and e audiobook. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And to separate language would be it would for be another a, day. <laughs> That'd be a different manifestation. I think. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And and that's the way I I would I would love to see ferberization work with sort of these these tabs for the you know novel film soundtrack recordings and and someone could go to novel and then pick their language and and say yeah it's like i just i just want it in english maybe okay the new barbara streisand book i just want it i don't care if it's an ebook a print novel or the audio book i want it as fast as possible put put the hold at the level that would get me whichever one's fastest or yeah it's like i want i want that e audio book i can drill down and and put that hold on the item level hey that's sinking in thank you it's a great thing for patrons yes, yes. i can see that and it can be a great thing for catalogers too because it helps in our awareness of these relationships that to make in the records well i'm going to uh like many of us are already getting on to our next things i've also got something i've got to get to so i'm going to go ahead and end the recording and thank you all for coming and looking forward to seeing you next month in april we're here on the first thursday i'll be there if i can good luck with your mom thank you